Hey, good morning. This is Pastor Jack C. Pigeon. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at West Houston Christian Center, and we're just honored that you've joined us to watch this broadcast. You know, a lot of time and prayer and preparation goes into our services because we believe that God has something for you today. There are all kinds of opportunities to catch up with West Houston Christian Center. You can give online, you can follow us through social media, you can join us on Facebook, or just go to our website, westhoustonchristian.com. Any way that we can minister to you through any medium, we are open and excited to do it. Man, we are just thrilled and honored that you've joined us. Enjoy the service, and we pray that God has something for you today. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture, all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is by inspiration of God and, is and is profitable to tell me what's right, tell me what's right. Tell me what's not right. Tell me, what's not right. Tell me how to get right. Tell me how to get right. And tells me how to stay right. Tell me how to stay right. So that I might so that I be the man or woman, woman worthy, worthy of, the calling of the calling of God. Of God. All scripture. When Paul penned that, the scripture that he's talking about are the Old Testament. Yeah. Right. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, when it downloaded everything about Jesus, that's what Paul had were the, was the, Old, were the Old Testament scriptures. He didn't have the New Testament scriptures. He may have heard about them, but he's looking at Isaiah 53, which talking about Jesus who bore all of our griefs, who went to the cross. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really awesome. And so every time we read the Bible, uh, it's God's word to us to benefit us. I like to say it this way, to give us an advantage in the world. Amen? Amen. If I, I didn't know how to cook, which I don't know how to cook. <laughs> but if I had a cookbook, if someone loved me enough to give me a cookbook, and if I would read that cookbook, if I would study it, if, if, if. But you understand, I would get knowledge. I would, I would, I would get something from that book. Well, that's what happens when we read the Bible. It's, it's, our, it's our cookbook. Oh, yeah. Amen. And, and how many are reading through the Bible with Pastor Jack? Several of us are reading through the Bible. Well, you know, we're reading in, in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and it can, get, it can get kind of bogged down with the begats and all the names of all the people. But uh, when we read it, he, God wants to, to, to open it up because it's advantageous to us today. The history, the Old Testament, is advantageous to us today when we read it. We find out the mighty acts of, of uh, the prophets and uh, we, we, David and, and Solomon and, and all those. And we, we see, golly, you know, they put their pants on the same way we put our pants on. You know, but they heard God and they listened to God. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is an interesting book. Uh, no one knows the author. Uh, everybody has an ideal about who wrote it. Uh, everybody wants to believe that Paul wrote it. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. But Hebrews is different than any other book that there is. The writer of Hebrews, even if it's a book of faith, you know, Hebrews 11, without faith it's impossible to please God. 11.1 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, and then it lists the whole chapter of faith, people that live by faith. Well, that's in Hebrews. But in the, in the uh, uh, third and fourth chapters of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is giving an account of apostasy. Does everybody understand and know what apostasy is? The definition of apostrophe is an abandonment a departure from. How many have ever started a diet? Come on. Okay. How many of you finished that diet? You're in apostasy. <laughs> you started something and you didn't finish it. I had a problem as a kid. I would always start something, but I never finished it. I just would get tired. I remember my daddy bought me a a balsam wood little airplane. You know, you, you made it and you, you threw it and it would fly. And I'd always have 10 pieces left over. 
And I was always wondering why that stupid thing wouldn't fly. But I, I would quit before I got to it. Well, that's, that's a, a Paul, no, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews is talking to the church about apostasy, about how soon that they had gotten away from the things of God. And we're going to see that that's happening today. Let me tell you what, uh, uh, what he is addressing. And, he's, and it's, he's, it's addressed to the Hebrews. So it's, a, it's addressed to the Jewish nation. Amen. But this is what apostasy is. And he's telling them, this is what's happened to you. You are now living in unbelief. Your conduct, you've changed your conduct away from walking with the Lord. Your neglect of public worship. In other words, the Hebrews back then, they were not public. Uh, they weren't worshiping publicly. They were kind of hiding and keeping it. Weakness in prayer. When a church becomes weak in prayer, they're getting close to the edge of apostasy. Amen. You're weak in prayer. Instability in doctrine. Well, what does that mean? Well, it might, well, it's okay. Well, it's okay. Instead of saying, no, the doctrine is this. You understand what I'm saying? Refusal, refusal to teach others the word of God. Apostasy. Neglect of the scriptures. And I believe, I mean, this is over 2,000 years ago. And this writer is talking to the, the church, the Hebrews, about how they had gotten into apostasy. They were neglecting public worship. They weren't reading their Bibles. They weren't praying. They probably weren't uh, talking to people about the Lord. And so the writer is, is really getting on them. And he talk, talks about how the people came out of Egypt, their forefathers, and God had a place called Canaan. Everybody understand that, right? Well, what happened is they came out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't come out of them. And the wilderness experience is that place of wandering around, delivered from, but not delivered to. And many, uh, the commentaries say, many Christians live like that. Because in the wilderness, what happened, they fell away. Turn, go, to, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 10. What? I'm not there yet. 1 Corinthians 10. Now this is Paul. This is Paul writing this. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea when they, when they uh, left Egypt. Remember, uh, possibly three to six million uh, left bondage and God took them out to the Red Sea. Moses is there with his staff. We all know that. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and they did all eat the same spiritual meat. Remember, he provided uh, manna and he provided quail and he provided water for them. Amen. And so they're, they're now leaving. It says, uh, and they did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. That's why we have a rock out front. Our rock that spews water. That rock followed them for 40 years. It provided a minimum of 3 million gallons a day for them and their animals. It says it followed them. They would be in one place for maybe a month and then they would move and then wake up the next morning and there's that rock. Isn't that cool? So he, Paul is reminding them and it says uh, the rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. God, God was mad at some of them for they were overthrown in the wilderness. It breaks God's heart when he delivers us from, but we don't get delivered to. We don't get that, that fullness of going into Canaan, which was, which was the promised land. Because later on, we're going to see why God wanted to do it was it's a place of rest. Because it talks about entering into his rest. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, there's five 
sins that they committed in the wilderness. Now, they'd been delivered from, but they hadn't gotten to Canaan yet. So there were five sins that destroyed them in the, in the uh, wilderness. Uh, and the first one was lust after evil things. Lust, they started lusting after things that were not of God. Amen? They were lusted. Neither be ye idolaters. They started worshiping other idols. Idols made by man's hand. Uh, they all committed fornication. Fornication is any sex outside of marriage. Man on man, woman on woman, man on beast, any kind of uh, uh, sexual activity that there was and they were overthrown. Uh, number five was they tempted Christ. Prove who you are. We tempt you to prove who you are. My goodness, they saw all the miracles and they tempted him. Number 10, <laughs> and they murmured against God. Any murmurs, murmurs in the crowd? Yeah, we've all murmured. But can you imagine tempting and murmuring uh, is the same level as idolatry and fornication. But they all sinned uh, and these all happened unto them as an example to us. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Number 13, and I like this. There hath no temptation taken you, but such that is common to man. Have you ever been tempted and you said, boy, no one's ever been tempted like this before. No one's ever gone through what I'm going through. Well, the, the Apostle Paul said, no, uh, anything you've been tempted through is common to man, but God is faithful. Say that, but God is faithful. And will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation will make a way of escape. That's powerful. That is, that is, that is powerful. That, that if, we, if we yield to temptation, then we're in trouble. But if in a temptation we call out to God, it said he is faithful to yeah. deliver us from that, from that temptation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So the writer of Hebrews, well, again, who I think was Paul, but we're not, we're not sure about that, uh, uh, wrote 1 Corinthians, and, and they're tying these two together. Hebrews, the people, the church was starting to drift away from God. The biggest thing that the writer of Hebrews had to deal with was that all these people had been under the law of Moses. And now here comes someone talking about Christ and grace instead of Moses and the law. Amen. How, how many people know what the problem with the law was? What do you think the big problem with the law was? Our flesh was too weak to keep it. But yet the Jewish nation, they, they didn't like to hear this grace saved by grace. They, they, they know the law, you must do this, you must do that. Well, Paul said because of that, there's condemnation in, in, in guilt. Yeah. But in grace, there is no condemnation. Right. Right. Amen. Uh, I, like, I like simple explanations. Uh, the speed limit is 75. The law says the speed limit is 75. Where did that law come from? Where did that law come from? Because people were driving 85 and 95. So sin was there, but with no law, there's no sin. There's no transgression. So man comes along and says, okay, we're going to put the speed limit at 75. Now when you break it, you've broken the law. Amen. Well, under grace, I still obey the law, but I, I do it because it's right, not because it's a law. Right? right. right? right. I do it because it's moral. It's ethical right. not to do it. I don't do it because it's a law. I do it because it pleases God yeah. that when we're, when we're not lawbreakers. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Amen. So... Um, in Hebrews, in the midst of this, he says, I want you to consider Christ. They really were having a hard time leaving Moses and going to Christ. Yeah. 
And they wanted to hold on to that, to that. It's like uh, I had a girlfriend before I met Mary Jean. But see, I had a girlfriend over here. And then I met Mary Jean. Well, the first thing I got to drop is I got to drop the old girlfriend. Mary Jean said, get rid of her. Amen. But when they came out of Egypt, the old girlfriend stayed with them. And as long as that girlfriend girlfriend stays with them, they'll never truly give themselves to this girlfriend. You understand? What was in Egypt, you need to leave in Egypt. When I, uh, when the Lord helped me with drinking before I, right when I got saved, uh, all of a sudden I found out I'm not going to those same places to drink. That old girl died. That old girl wasn't, wasn't uh, entertaining to me anymore. I didn't need to go to that bar or to that place and drink. I got delivered from. Yeah, are you catching me? I got delivered from smoking. I got delivered from cussing. When I say delivered, they're, they're in Egypt. I didn't bring them with me. Now, there were some things that I did bring that over the years I've gotten rid of. Everybody done that? Sanctific- sanctification sometimes is right now. And then sometimes it's long. <laughs> It's just, it's hard to get rid of stuff, but uh, because the flesh, uh, and you know, and, and we talk a lot about the flesh and about the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But sometimes the flesh seems to win out. And Paul, uh, I think it's in chapter uh, seven and eight of uh, Romans. Paul says, why do I do the things I know I shouldn't be doing? Paul, I'm saying, are you kidding me, Paul? You're writing that? You're saying those things? He's saying, why do I still sin? But he said, it's not my spirit that sins. It's that, oh, it's that flesh in me. It's the works of the flesh that sins. But, but my spirit man does not sin. Right. So he says, we work out to get mastery over our flesh. Yes. Amen. How do we get mastery over our flesh? We spend more time in the spirit. The spiritual things, praying, singing, worshiping, serving, giving. Those are all works of the spirit. And if my, if my mind and my heart are on those things, then I won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. I won't be thinking about uh, those things that my flesh desires. Because, you know, we're all here today and we're all breathing and got blood flowing in our leg and that we still have lust. We still have things that are, that, you know, the things that tempt us, the things that want to take me back and do stuff, get angry. I guess that's the biggest thing right there is I, uh, my flesh jumps at anger. I hate, I hate dishonesty. I, I, I hate uh, when someone does something stupid to somebody my flesh just rears up. Mary Jean will hear me and, and I'll say, well, just shoot them. If I hear something on the news, I'll say, well, just shoot them. <laughs> oh, Lord, I don't mean that. Get him saved, then shoot him. But we all deal with that. We all deal. Fear is attached to our flesh. Yeah. Grace is attached to our faith. Uh, Faith, we can't see it. We see it in the spirit realm. But my flesh is, or my senses, see it, feel it, hear it, touch it, smell it. Amen? And I'm, that's my flesh. When, I'm, when I do the things of my flesh, that's why I'm doing it is because of my senses. But when I step into the spirit realm, which we all do, then we exercise our faith and God says that by his stripes we are healed. I have healing. Amen. I see it. Amen. It's mine. See, faith, faith speaks of things as be not as though they were. Uh, my God shall provide all of my needs. Amen? Amen. Uh, Pastor, are you sure about that? Well, that's what the world said. Mm-hmm. Paul said that in Ephesians. 
My God shall provide all. Whatever I needed, my, my God's going to provide that. So we're, we're, we're spirit people because we're believing God's word. Amen. The flesh doesn't want to believe God's word. The flesh wants to believe, uh, yeah, what, what I can see and touch and everything. Amen. The purpose of the book of Hebrews, it's called an epistle, is to inform the discouraged. The people that he's writing this letter to, they were very discouraged. They weren't seeing things happen. They were scattered. Uh, people were being killed because of their faith. Amen. Uh, to inform the discouraged, but also to encourage the church. I think that's one of the greatest things that we can do as a body of believers is to encourage each other. Yeah, not... Because we all go through stuff and we just need some encouragement. Someone to hold your hand, someone to pray with you, someone to say, you know, I look, it looks bad right now, but the word says, yeah. you know, you get a bad report from the doctor, but the word says, see, that's encouragement. That's, yeah. that's encouragement. And, uh, and you say, well, has God ever done something for you before? Well, yeah. Well, guess what? He's going to do it again. Yeah. Right. Amen. We all need encouragement. We have people that come to church every Sunday, every Tuesday, and they just need encouragement. They just need someone. You're going to make it. It's, it's going to be all right. See, God's already been into your tomorrow. He's been into your next week. He's already gone before you, the Bible says, as a consuming fire. Well, if he's gone before me into my situation, he's doing something while I'm there. So I don't have to worry. He said, don't worry about what you're even supposed to say. God will give you the words to say when you get there. Well, if I've got a situation that I'm going into next Thursday at 10 o'clock in the morning, for me to, uh, or, or my brother William's going into a situation, I just say, well, brother William, God's already been there. Amen. He's already been to that meeting at 10 o'clock and he's for you and not against you. And he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I just want to encourage you in that. And so there's no fear when you go into that meeting. Wow, God's already been, he's already gone there. You understand what I'm saying? That's what a spirit man does. Regardless of what it looks like. And you don't, we don't let fear come in and, and say, oh, man, I'm, I hate to go into that meeting. Oh, God, I hate going into that meeting. No, no, man, you're going to go in with your, with your chest out, and you're going to go in walking tall because God's already gone before you. Amen. God's on your side. If God be for you, who can be against you? See, that's what we do. That's the difference. Well, he's encouraging the, the Hebrew, really, nation at that time because they were, they were wanting to cut bait and run. They were going back, unbelief, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They said, My, at least we had some onions to eat back there. Why did we come out here to, you know, for us to die out here? Unbelief will always take you backwards. Faith will always take you forwards. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Faith keeps, uh, faith keeps working. Um, Paul also wrote in 2 Timothy 3.14, he said, but continue... In that which you have learned, and that which you are assured of. Yeah. That, that's a powerful statement. There's one thing to learn something, but he says, no, don't just learn something. Stand fast in what you've learned. Continue in what you've learned. Yeah. Well, I've learned that God loves me, and he'll never take his love away from me. Amen? Yeah. No height, no depth, no Nothing can separate me from the love of God. So about the time I'm feeling like God doesn't love me, well, the Word, no, the Word says, uh, I'm going to continue in what the Word says about me. And the Word says that He'd never leave me nor forsake me. The Word says, for God so loved the world, well, that's me. Uh, John 15 says that He loves me and He'll never leave me. Wow. So when I'm feeling like, nope, you know, the Lord doesn't love me, that I'm outside of his realm, I have to continue in what I've learned. Amen. I think that's why we come on Tuesday night. See, we're here learning tonight. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, it won't be a whole bunch, but it'll be a nugget. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a nugget to say, you know, we're going to make it. You know, yeah. we're, we're encouraged. Uh, this was the exhortation that the writer gave to uh, he exhorted them and let them know, you're drifting away from God. How many has someone you can say they're drifting away from God? Yeah. 
It was happening back then. We've had people in our church that it, they, they drifted. You know, uh, we had a couple, a sweet couple, young couple, and uh, they enjoyed uh, uh, Lake uh, Conroe. They loved going to the, the lake and doing all of that, and they, but they didn't have a boat. They wanted a boat, so we prayed for a boat. We prayed that the Lord would make a way where they could get a boat, a ski boat, and I don't know how long it took, but they got a ski boat, beautiful ski boat. We went, we went up there. Uh, we would go up there and get on the lake and, and uh, ride with them. Oh, it was just beautiful. And um, it all, we'd all come back Saturday night, and we'd all be in church Sunday morning. Whoa, yay. But then pretty soon uh, they started drifting, and they wouldn't come back on Sunday morning. They'd rather stay on the lake, and they finally... That were the, the, got divorced. You know, see what I'm saying? When you, when you, we need to help those that start drifting. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't have a good ministry of doing that. But just, uh, hey, we miss you. Yeah. I hadn't seen you in a while. Well, you know, we've been busy and we've been doing this and we've been doing that and that and that and that. Uh, they're really lying to you because they've just, they've lost it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And so the same thing happened over 2,000 years ago. Drifting away from God, doubting God. Well, I just don't believe God will do that. Boy, that's a, that's a bad place to ever get. Because if He's done it before, He'll do it again. Yeah. Amen. All I have to do is think back on what He's already done for me. Yeah. We, had a, we had a friend in the Methodist church that got radically baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. And, uh, but he never used it after that because he said it was such a great experience. There was nothing that would ever be any greater than that. Wow. You know, what God does for us today is just a pinch of what things he wants to do for us. Amen. Uh, doubting God. Number three, disbelieving God. And he talks about let not your heart be hardened because of the tribulation. If you're going to walk with God, if we are going to walk with God, we're going to have persecution. Yes. Amen. And he's saying, yep, you're going to have persecution, but don't, don't, let, it, don't let, let your heart be hardened. Which, you know, if you watch the news, your heart will be hardened. Yeah. I catch, that's when my heart gets the most upset is when I watch what's going on. Uh, this thing in New York with these police officers, they were making an arrest and the people got out and poured water on them. Poured water on our police. Because they were arresting some goofball because of some law that he broke. And so the cops show up to arrest them. And people come out with uh, buckets of water and douse them. And the police don't retaliate. That would have really been bad. That kind of stuff is crazy. But if you watch that, it makes your heart. You just want to go shoot somebody. I'm sorry. I'm sure Boy, that's, that's why William's a police officer and I ain't. <laughs> Golly. The wilderness journey, they went backward in unbelief. People come to church and they get so excited and uh, I guess they don't, they don't see anything. They don't stay connected. And uh, there's probably more people out of church than are in church. Amen. You know, something happened. Someone got offended. Someone prayed. It didn't work out. Um, you know, God is, uh, he's big. He's big. One of the first times Mary Jean and I had a chance to pray for someone with cancer, uh, a good friend of ours, and she had she had contacted uh, she had cancer, and I remember going over to her house, their house, and praying and and uh, worshiping. And as we would worship, she would quit breathing real hard, and and as we quit worshiping, she'd start gasping for air. and And I remember asking her, and this, I don't know what month this was, but maybe June or something, uh, Barano. And uh, and I started asking her. I said, "What plans do you have for Christmas?" And like this was maybe June or something like that. And she said, what? And I said, well, what plans? Are you making plans for? They had nine kids. Are y'all, what are you planning for Christmas? What's Christmas going to be like? 
Well, see, death had already set in her, and she there was she she couldn't do that. But we prayed, and and we left there, and we said, "Well, thank you, Jesus. She's healed." The word says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And we were new. We just started our church 30 years ago. And I remember we're going home and we're rejoicing. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And we got home and the phone call that she had passed away. Amen. And, and again, we were, we were new in this. But uh, thank God we, we had enough in us that it didn't affect us. Now we questioned, you know, uh, Mary Jean finally did get an answer as to why because uh, he told us to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Yeah. Amen. And uh, uh, but her, you know a lot of people say well she got her she got her divine healing uh, uh, God heals people yeah. and we're to lay hands on the sick. Yeah. Amen. Our good friend Jenny Stinson in the church we were standing right here praying for her and I'm, I'm about right here. And I remember the Lord telling me, he said, I want you to paint yourself in that corner where there's nowhere you can go but believe in me. He told me that. He said, paint yourself in a corner. And I went over and I stood in that corner. And, and I said, Lord, there's nowhere to go but just trusting in you. Yeah. Amen. And we prayed and we prayed and uh, she passed away. But God heals. Right. Amen. And I don't lose my faith because what I prayed for, I didn't see it come to pass. You know, I, uh, what a beautiful lady and uh, what a blessing she was to this church. But uh, it doesn't stop us from laying hands on the sick. Yeah. Amen. Uh, the word says that. And I'm not, oh, well, I did that before and, and, and they died. Well, lay hands on the sick. Yeah. Are you seeing what I'm saying? See, but stuff like that causes people to drift. You know, people, you, you talk about tithing. You talk about the beauty of tithing. You talk about how God uh, blesses. Uh, he'll open up the windows of heaven. And we've had people say, uh, well, Pastor, I, I, I tithed last month and I ain't seen nothing. <laughs> yeah, but we tithed and, 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 and the car broke down. We tithed and the dishwasher broke down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the way it works. Just keep on tithing. That's Just right. keep on keeping on doing it. But uh, the people leave. Well, you're talking. It doesn't work. I'm here to encourage you tonight. The word of God works. Amen. 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 And it's not based on what happened to somebody else. Oh, yeah. It's based on your relationship with God and the words that you speak over a situation. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, they went backwards in unbelief instead of going forward in faith. Yeah. Amen. It said most of Israel was out of Egypt, but they were not yet in Canaan. Remember they sent the 12 spies to go in, Moses, Aaron, and, and uh, Joshua. And they, and, uh, er, yeah, they went in and uh, they said they brought back fruit that was so big they had it handle it, you know, put it up between their, uh, between their arms and carry it in. And uh, 10 of them came back and said, whoa, not me. Oh, man, no. But see, God had promised them. See, this is where they lost. They lost that they had heard the promise that God said, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Yes. They lost that. They quit looking at faith and they started looking at the giants in the land. Oh, we can't do it. They're, they're big bubbas. We, 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 can't, we can't do it. They'll, they'll, they'll surely destroy us. But it just took two men, Cain and Abel. Not Cain and Abel. Joshua and Caleb. 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 <laughs> Where'd they come from? Are they still alive? <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. And they said, no. No, we can do it. And the Bible says, because they had a different spirit inside of them. Amen. Well, that's what God's looking for us today. That's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to instill back in the, in the, in the people is get out of unbelief, disbelief, and get into faith and take what's rightfully yours. Amen. Like we said the other day, God said he had opened up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. I don't think that's just money. I think whatever has got my name on it in heaven, I'm saying, Lord, open up the windows and let it out. I don't want to see my name on something when I get to heaven. 
I don't want him to take me to a room and say, that could have been yours. No, Lord, I want it all. If, it, it, if you, there's windows in heaven and they can be opened, then there's stuff up there that's mine in the earth. I don't have to wait to heaven to get it. Amen? Oh, he's good. Amen. It says in uh, Hebrews 3, 7, Today, if you will hear his voice, How many hear God talk to you? Some people say you're crazy. I told you I was playing golf one day and I can't remember what I'd, I'd had some good prayer time that morning and I had prayed about something and I, and I heard God say, now I heard God say, I don't know if it was, you know, I heard him say it through here or if I actually heard it, but I just, I just said out loud that I, that, you know, this is what God said. You heard, this, this guy said, you heard God this morning? I said, yeah, I hear God a lot. Yeah. It usually cuts off the conversation. It usually, <laughs> they don't want to go any more. But if we are spirit beings, yeah. God is a spirit, and we can hear the voice of God. Yeah. Amen. But isn't that sweet? And it's usually, it's usually, it's usually sweet. Mary Jean, she'll share all the time that she did something and the Lord said, Mary Jean, I can't remember what the last one was, but you shared, you share a lot of times that, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Thank you, Lord. Uh, in three, seven, he's saying today, if you hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as your fathers did. Amen. Now that's all, that's, all, that's all at the end of chapter 3. And really what I want to get to is chapter 4. He said, therefore, fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. God is desirous of us, every one of us, entering into his rest. Amen? That's what, that's what Canaan was all about. It wasn't a place of slavery. It was a place of rest in him. And heaven is a, is a, is a resting place for us as, as Christians. Amen? But in verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. There's an us's and a them's. And the gospel was preached to both groups. Amen? You understand that? As well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed in faith, mixed with faith in them that heard it. You know, Pastor Jack, Mary Jean, every, every Tuesday night, we've been doing it for, I don't know, two years, teaching on faith. Yeah. And faith is hearing the word and acting on the word yeah. and mixing our faith with the word. Give, and it'll be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shall men give into your bosom. Yeah. Cast your water upon the sea, and in many days it'll come back to you. Whatsoever things you plant, that shall you reap. If you plant sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you plant abundantly, you will reap abundantly. I mix my faith with that. Yeah. Again, and I've said that to the church. Mary Jean and I, when we first got saved, the first revelation that I think that the both of us got was about tithing. Yeah. We just kind of looked at one another and we said, Okay, we're supposed to tithe. You know, that, that, that was the word. And we got it, and we started, we started tithing. And we couldn't afford to tithe. I wasn't making it on 100%, and now we're going to make something happen on 90%. But we started it, and we had, we had rough, some rough spots. Uh, I love the story of, I was in the insurance business, and we got paid every eighth. On the eighth of every month, I got a paycheck. And... And I was a salesman, 
And so it was like that. You know, one month, and this is back in the 70s, and I'd have a month of $7,000. Woo! And then next month I'd have a check of $2,200. Or or, but, but I remember one day something happened and I, I got some chargebacks. And uh, it was the 8th. And I want to say it was in February. I don't know why. But Mary Jean's expecting me to come home. And uh, I got a check. I opened it up and it's $400. And last month was $7,000. And so I, I went to drive in and I just kept driving. <laughs> and I drove around the block and I got and I came back to the house and I drove around the block again and I finally go in of course the first thing out of her mouth is did we get paid today I can go to Kroger's <laughs> but you know it was one of the greatest months we ever had we, we paid we paid our tithe we paid our house, house note Yeah. Wow. And then we had nothing left. And then we had nothing. But we had that in the freezer and I bought, we got a baked potato. But God, I mean it was just crazy. It was money, money came out of the woodwork. Right. Yeah. Checks that we got in the mail from an account that I had written five years earlier that had they went bankrupt. They went bankrupt. Well, when a company you write insurance on goes bankrupt, you get no commission. Amen? Five years earlier, and I go to the mailbox. That's when they mail delivered it to your house. (laughs) And I went to the, I went to the, during this month, I went to the uh, post office, the the mailbox, and there was a check from my old uh, insurance company that I had wrote this insurance through and there was a check made out to me for $1,700. And they had settled that account. They made the company pay, and that was my commission on that account, and they had written me a check during that month for $1,700. I remember crying, because God is faithful to his word, because we purposed we're going to tithe. Now see, the temptation would have been $400? Well, we can't afford to tithe this month. That, that temptation comes. Well, we can't afford this. We gotta, I gotta, and I had a secretary. I had a secretary. And a wife. But God, three kids. So three kids, and somehow we made it. Yeah. But God's word works. You do. But Mary Jean became very creative cooking. We <laughs> emptied out the pantry. I'm telling you, we, we, ate some, we ate some good stuff. But see, Hebrews, see, Hebrews 3 is, t- I mean, we're finding out that this was the, the temperature of the Hebrew nation at the time that the writer is telling them about. Don't let your heart be hardened. I want to encourage you. Uh, the same God that delivered you out of Egypt is the same God that will keep you in the wilderness. And he's the same God that will take you into your promised land. Amen. Yeah. The wilderness is, uh, God never intended for the wilderness to last 40 years anyway. Right. But he knew for their benefit, had he done it in two weeks, the first time they had a little squabble, that have all gone back to Egypt. Yeah. Amen. So, for unto us was the gospel preached, the good news, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. When does the word preached not profit somebody? When they don't take it by faith. I grab it. Lord, I said, I take that by faith. Healing. And we've all all had a time in our life when we we just had to pray for healing. Uh Amen. Sometimes you just lay hands on yourself. And you say, Lord, by your stripes I am healed. You sent your word and healed them. I speak healing over my body right now, Father, in Jesus' name. Uh, And we don't do it just because we do it. We do it because we're thinking, well, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. You said lay hands on the sick and they shall shall recover. Call for the elders of a church. Let them anoint them with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah. That's why we say it works. Amen. Uh, God goes before us. We have the mind of Christ. Everybody know you have the mind of Christ? Yes. Well, I, I prayed that the other day. I said, Lord, if I have the mind of Christ, then I have all wisdom and understanding. I understand things. Because yes. there was something I didn't understand. Right. And I'm thinking, no, I can understand that because I have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Father, that I understand this. And you know what happened? I understood that. Well, I'm, I'm reading uh, chapter 7 and 8 of Romans, and, I, and I'm saying, Lord, I really want to understand Paul. I really want to understand what he's, what he's going through when he's talking about the, the flesh and the, and the spirit and about the law and grace. And, and, he, and he, just, he says, Lord, why do I do the things that I'm doing? Why do I sin? But he said, it's no longer I that sin, but it's the flesh in me that sins, you know? Hallelujah. It's all good, isn't it? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's a good place to stop. Thank you, Lord. So the gospel preached did not profit people because they did not mix their faith with it. So when we mix our faith with the word of God, it works. And we stay with it. He said, continue in that which you have learned and that which you are assured of. And then, and then Paul says, and remember who taught it to you. <laughs> Paul threw that in there. Oh, and by the way, remember that I'm the one that I'm the one that taught that to you. But the world needs our faith. The world, co-workers, family, school teachers, students, they need to see your faith. Because when you let when they know that you're a Christian, they really want two reactions from you. Number one, they want you to sin, so they'll say, You're just like me. Or number two, they want to see that, that, that your faith works and they're hungry for that. Yeah. They're hungry for that. Amen? Amen. So we, uh, uh, we're going to be dispersed from here tonight and we're all going to go different places. We're probably going to go home. But tomorrow we're going to go to work. We're going to go to school. We're going to go to the grocery store. We are going to go somewhere. And we carry, as Brother Robert talked about Sunday, we carry that anointing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and we're just, we're just a, a, a missile just waiting for something to happen so that we, can, that we can do something. We can go pray. We can go lay hands on somebody. We can encourage somebody. I mean, we can buy someone's lunch. We can buy someone's groceries. There, there's, that anointing on us when we go out is to show the world that Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Stand to your feet. Brother Jack will be next week. Preaching on faith. Yeah. Amen. Did you get anything tonight? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. You, I, I, I get something. Uh, when I get up in the morning, as soon as I have my coffee and my dog, I'm reading the Word. Yeah. I love getting up and sitting on my patio and reading the Word and, and, uh, and, and asking the Lord, Lord, it's for me today. I want to receive today what you, what you want me to receive today. And, and when I was reading in Acts about uh, the, 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 uh, Paul, when he's telling, he said, an angel of the Lord whose I am and whom I serve. I mean, it just jumped off the page. And I was thinking, Lord, that's me. The God who I belong to and the God I serve. It's one thing to belong to something, but if you don't serve, Amen. So those two things, they go together. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Father. You said you sent your word and healed them. So I believe healing is in this place tonight, Father. I pray, grab hands with that person next to you. Let's just pray healing. Father, we just pray healing for the, the person on my left and on my right. Father, from the top of their head to the tip of their toes. Oh, Father God, we just praise you. and We just thank you that healing is surging through their body right now. Father, I come, I come against any sickness and any disease, known or unknown, Lord. Yes. Known or unknown. If they know it, we curse it in Jesus' name. If they don't know it, we curse it in Jesus' name. But Father, I just pray healing. I pray the love of God to flood them from the top of their heads to the tip of their toes. And Father, by your stripes, they are healed. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you, Lord.